morning. Welcome to the Sunday morning worship service for Sunday, February 20th, 2022. This has been a challenging several weeks in the city of Ottawa with the demonstrations and the occupation in the downtown core. And this weekend, especially as we've watched as police have come in and begun to remove the protesters who have turned into an occupation. We pray for everybody involved. We pray for peace and we hope and pray that things have gone well. As of recording this on Saturday afternoon, the protesters have begun to be removed from the downtown area, from Wellington Street, and we do hope and pray that things go peacefully. Now, as we gather for this worship service as well, we know that this is the day the Lord has made, and so we rejoice and we're glad in it. Sam's going to lead us in our call to worship. God is our help and our refuge. God's love is from everlasting to everlasting. It is God who made us, and we are his children. Sing a song to the Lord. It is right to offer the Lord our worship and our praise. Let us worship God. Let's join together in our opening hymn, Come Let Us Sing to the Lord Our Song. Come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, hear the words of a grateful people. Help us, O oh God, not to take your gifts for granted in our lives, gifts of love and life within family and among friends, gifts in the whole of creation and in the gathering of your people, gifts we celebrate in ways that we can put into words and ways that go well beyond words. We also pray, O oh God, as we come together for peace peace in our lives, peace in our city, in our community, peace in what we do and what we say. Help us to be channels of your peace, O God. We ask this in Jesus' name and pray together with his words singing. Hear the good news of the gospel that is shared with us. God has given us the gift of new life and the gift of fresh beginnings. The sins of yesterday are part of the past. The present is a place where we are a forgiven people. And the future is God's future, filled with unlimited potential and with hope. 
Believe the gospel. We are forgiven, and life has begun anew. Thanks be to God. Reading from Psalm 37 of David. Do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so you will live in the land and enjoy security. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. He will make your vindication shine like the light, and the justice of your cause like the noonday. Be still before the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Do not fret over those who prosper in their way, over those who carry out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. For the wicked shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. Yet a little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you look diligently for their place, they will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight in abundant prosperity. Good morning. Welcome to Children's Time. My celebration this morning is for some birthdays this week. Um, this past Saturday was Daniel's birthday, and this coming Friday is Alan's birthday. And I know there are lots of other birthdays out there as well, so this is a celebration for all the birthdays that we share. You might be wondering why I'm wearing my, uh, my apron this morning, and this is the apron that I use when I'm baking or cooking at home as well. And you notice some stains on it, that's, that's because we've used, I've used it a fair bit for, for baking and cooking. The reason I'm wearing it, though, is that I figured out something this week in our Bible reading that I have never known before, and that was kind of exciting. This passage uh, says, at the end of it, we heard it read this morning, it says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap, for the measure you give will be the measure you get back. And I've never known what that passage has meant. And so I looked it up this week and I read more and more about it. And it's kind of an interesting passage. It is about how uh, people used to go and shop. And sometimes people would shop with, uh, sometimes they would take their own measuring cups with them when they shop, their own way of measuring the amount of grain or flour or whatever they were getting. And the measure you give is the measure you get. And apparently some people, if you were running a shop, sometimes they would trade grain and things like that. So you would come in with some grain and you would trade it for some rice. Or you'd come in with some, some flour and you'd trade it for something else. And sometimes they would use different size cups. So the cup that they would measure for when you were bringing something in would be a bigger cup. And the cup they'd use for when they're selling would be a slightly smaller cup. And it was a way of, of cheating people out of what they were buying. And so when it says the measure you give will be the measure you get, um, that's what they meant. And interestingly, in part of it was also uh, when it says uh, you're, it will be filled to the, to the brim um, and to overflowing, um, it made me think about uh, the good measure. And it filled up. So when you're filling something up, you fill it up and, and sometimes, oh, I'm spilling a little bit there. Uh-oh, what's, what's going to happen with that? So when you fill it up, um, you know, sometimes it doesn't fill right to the top. So you shake it a little bit, and then it becomes level and even. And then you can fit a little bit more in. And then you shake it, and you make it even. And sometimes, if you're using brown sugar or something, uh, it actually doesn't press down very much. So you can press it down with your hands. So when you fill it up, and you press it down, and you keep filling and keep filling and keep filling, and it says you fill it right to the brim, and then it says to overflowing. And this is a reminder for us that, that God gives us things uh, and God's love for us is to overflowing. But it reminds us that when we give to others, um, we give until we're overflowing as well. We give as much as we can when we're sharing with others. And when we give, we also receive. 
And so what we give to others and how we choose to help and share with others is partly how people treat us as well. And then it says it's going to put that in your lap. Well, that doesn't seem to make much sense, does it? But I found out that what that means is that when people went shopping, they would sometimes wear, they'd be wearing a robe of some kind. And when they went to do the shopping, if they weren't bringing their own bags or their own cups, they would actually take what they were receiving and pour it in their lap. And that's what they would do with their robe. They would open the robe up like that, and then they could hold the, uh, the, the grain that they were buying. And that's what it meant, that it meant when they said, it will fill up your lap. And then you could go like that, and you could carry it home, and then when you get home, you put it into a container. So it's interesting to learn about that, that Bible reading and how, um, how it meant that, that what we put into life, what we do in helping others, is also what we're going to receive back in our lives too. And to remember that God has given us out of great abundance already. Let's have a prayer together. Dear God, help us to remember to share with others what we have. Help us to remember as well that what we give in this life is often what we get back as well. Help us to be generous in the same way that you are generous. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go now in peace. The Gospel reading is from Luke, chapter 6, verses 27 to 38. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also, and from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. Let's join together in singing, Lead Me, Lord.
Let us pray. Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and the meditations of all of our hearts, may they be acceptable to you, our God and our guide. Amen. Well, I have to begin by admitting to you that I have always found this morning's gospel reading to be very challenging. In fact, as I was looking at the scripture readings that were coming up and I saw that this was the scripture reading for this Sunday in the lectionary, I laughed out loud and then started going through the Bible looking for something else to preach on this Sunday. Especially since we've just recently been talking about loving our neighbors and the challenge of defining who the neighbor is. And now we have to talk about loving our enemies as well. Well, who are our enemies? And the more I thought about it, the more I wished that there had been some wise person in the crowd when Jesus was saying this, who had said, Jesus, well, who is my enemy? The way the lawyer does in the Gospel of Luke in a little while and says, who is my neighbor? When the lawyer asked Jesus this, Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan to explain who our neighbors are, reminding us that our neighbors might be an unexpected person. The neighbor is the one who helps us like the Good Samaritan helped the traveler in the story. So who is my enemy that I'm supposed to love? And what does that love even look like? At Bible study this week, we had a few problems when we read this passage. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt. Is that really what it means to be a Christian? That sounds a little more to me like what it means to be a doormat, to let people walk all over you. And this isn't just an ego thing that, that we can't possibly do this. This, I think, could be very dangerous as well. Do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. You can't take this passage and apply it to everyone's relationship in every situation. It sounds like really bad advice, especially to anyone who's in an abusive relationship. And if you know someone who's been in an abusive relationship or is in an abusive relationship, it can be a dangerous thing to hear these words, especially if the passage is misused by the abuser. Be aware how this has been used in the history of the church and with other people. And if you know someone in a relationship like that, help them to get help. So who is my enemy then? When I read this passage and, and whenever I preached on this before, I've always reflected on the historical context of the people in Jesus' day. And I've seen this passage in terms of the Jewish people being an oppressed people under the Roman Empire, an overpowering legal authority. In not that context, when people are dealing one-on-one -on -one with Roman soldiers in the streets and in their communities, it makes sense not to fight back when you're struck by a Roman soldier. Try not to try and get your things back, your belongings, when some, a Roman soldier takes away your belongings. But even in that context, being told to, to love their enemies, that seems just a step too far. And what about us today? What about dealing with our enemies today and who are our enemies today? Are the protesters, those who are occupying our city, my enemy? Are they the enemy of the police? Do they see the police as their enemies? Do they see politicians as their enemies? Or is it just the prime minister who is their enemy? Are the people who do not hold my political views, my theological views, are those people who don't hold my views my enemy? Who is my enemy? And what happens when we define an enemy? How do we define a person? Is the entire person my enemy? Are they defined by an ideology that they hold? Is the entire person defined by their words, their actions? It's a part of who they are. Does that person become my enemy? Enemies do become personified in wartime in particular. Then it seems we get the stereotype, the demonizing of the other. The enemy needs to be defined as someone who's less than human. 
because it's not easy to fight the other person if we see ourselves in that other person as well. If we ourselves being, see ourselves not being so different from our enemy. Sadly, we see this caricature in our politics as well, where the things that are different about our points of view need to be highlighted, need to be focused on, in order to try and distinguish one party from another, and we forget all the things that we have in common when we focus so much on our differences. We forget that we are called to do things for the common good. We forget where we have common ground. For a time in our country, it seemed as though we did have a measure of unity because we had a common enemy in COVID-19. Political parties managed to work together to fight against COVID. Our governments and all pers political persuasions of the government managed to pass budgets that helped so many people. The federal government managed to procure enough vaccine to vaccinate our entire country several times over and then worked with the provincial governments to develop a strategy to distribute the vaccine to the most vulnerable people first. It wasn't perfect. But there was an acknowledgement that we're all making decisions on the fly right now and the best information we have at the time is what we're going to use to make those decisions in a situation that's ever-changing information and where we all are doing our best to do what we can with what we have and we're working together. But we're past the crisis stage now, it would seem. That common enemy of COVID-19 is less of a threat and so it's time to go back to fighting the old enemies and to highlight the old political differences and to point out other people's mistakes along the way in order to gain the upper hand politically. As though some people knew exactly how this whole thing was going to proceed from the very beginning. As though some people knew exactly how the virus was going to change and mutate and when the waves were going to come and they kept that information from other people. And people knew when the different lockdown measures and mandates might be necessary for us as a society, for the common good of all of us, especially for the most vulnerable among us. Some people seem to think that others knew this information and didn't share it. And people make political gain about, over how things have gone. And no one is innocent in all of this. And uh, along the way, there was a small but significant minority of the population who felt like they had been left behind. They did not see the common enemy in COVID-19, but saw the enemy as those who limited their freedoms. The enemy became the government and anyone who had any measure of power over their lives. What if? What if you don't trust the experts? What if you don't trust science? What if you don't trust the media? What if you don't trust the police? What if you don't see yourself reflected in any of the elected officials? And what if you have people telling you that you're right not to trust any of them? People who you do trust telling you this. People who think the same way you do. People like politicians who did not manage to get elected or who have been elected in the past and have been kicked out of their political parties for holding the same kind of views that you hold. People like YouTube bloggers and, and alternative media sources and friends on Facebook and Twitter. Or people like your pastor in your church telling you don't trust these people. It seemed to me, seemed to me to be obvious when I read this passage that my enemy right now must be the people involved in the occupation of downtown Ottawa. They are making me angry. They're making me frustrated. The lack of respect for people in the downtown, friends of mine who've been accosted and screamed at for wearing a mask in the downtown. It's been observed that there were two kinds of demonstrations that were going on in Ottawa. There were two different, different things that were happening. If you're part of the demonstration, if you agree with what's being said and done in the demonstration and you're in that gathering on Wellington Street in front of the Parliament buildings, then it was a peaceful, bouncy castle kind of street party. But if you weren't in that area, if you didn't agree with the demonstrations, and you were a visible minority or wearing a mask 
or showing a rainbow flag in front of your home, you could very well be the target of hate speech and verbal and physical harassment. And this is more than just anecdotal stories or more than just one or two people. It's been reported that according to the Ottawa police, protesters from the Freedom Convoy are being investigated for more than 200 hate crimes. Who's my enemy? Why didn't someone pipe up when Jesus told this story and say, but who is my enemy? Is it the Romans? Is it the Pharisees? Is it the Sadducees? Is it the Zealots in Galilee? Is it the high priests? Who is my enemy? When we talked about this at Bible study, we remembered stories about enemies who actually managed to come together. Stories of soldiers in the trenches in World War I coming out into neutral territory and singing Silent Night together. It's hard to continue to be enemies when you see what you have in common. So who is my enemy? Are the protesters who have been occupying Ottawa my enemy? Back to our scripture reading. Jesus is speaking to a whole crowd of people when he says these words. He's just told the crowd that some of them are blessed, especially when they're poor, when they're hungry, and when they're oppressed. And some of them are, are in trouble, especially when they're well off, when their bellies are full and people speak well of them. And then Jesus says, in the transition into today's reading, he says, but I say to you that listen, but I say to you that listen, that almost seems like an acknowledgement that some are going to listen to what he says next and some really are not. But I don't think Jesus was speaking to one side or the other side when he said this. I think Jesus' words are actually bridging the gap and presenting a different way of living, a much harder way of living, but potentially a life-changing way of living to anyone who will listen. And Jesus jumps into what seems to be the most difficult thing in the world to do. He says, love your enemies. I keep trying to explain to myself what Jesus really meant by these instructions. And then I keep wondering if I have ears to listen to it. It does feel like he's telling us just to give in to our enemies. Let them walk all over us and don't stand up for ourselves. If we don't like what Jesus is saying, though, what is the alternative? Let's see what it would sound like if we turn the passage around 180 degrees. But I say to you who won't listen, hate your enemies. Do evil to those who hate you. Curse those who curse you. Hurt those who hurt you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, strike back at them. And from anyone who takes away your coat, when the opportunity arrives, take their coat from them. Give to no one who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, get them back right away. Do to others exactly as you think they have done to you. Do to others exactly as you think they have done to you. That doesn't sound like a world that I would like to live in. And yet, in many ways, it seems like a pretty good description of what we often see around us. It is seen as weak not to respond to force with force, or to respond to injustice with proportional response. In fact, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth either seems to demand or allow this. Although I love one commentator who said, if we really implement an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, pretty soon we're all going to have no teeth in our mouths and we'll all be blind. But Jesus is envisioning a different kind of world, a better world where the cycle of violence is actually stopped. There are a few verses in this passage that do stand out. And for me, they seem to sum up what Jesus is saying. Love your enemies. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Imagine what that could be like. That is not a world where hurt and abuse are tolerated and encouraged. It is a world where mercy and generosity are the norm. It is interesting that there is a very similar passage in the Gospel according to Matthew, very similar to the one we have this morning. 
And the end of that passage in the Gospel of Matthew reads, be perfect therefore as your heavenly Father is perfect. Luke, on the other hand, says, be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. This passage isn't an easy one to hear. And I know it's an even harder passage for us to live out. None of us is perfect, but perhaps we can strive to be merciful. Who is my enemy? My enemy is a fiction. My enemy is a stereotype. My enemy is a two-dimensional representation of another human being. The protesters who occupied the downtown of our city are not my enemy. The people who hold different political and theological views from me are not my enemy. Maybe if Jesus had been asked, who is my enemy, he might have responded with the parable that he had for who is my neighbor. Because my enemy is my neighbor. But my neighbor need not be my enemy. As we live our lives dealing with many people who are challenging to deal with, may we be guided by Jesus' words, especially his words from the second part of this passage. Because in the second part of the passage we have this morning, Jesus shifts into a focus on, on not how we're supposed to react when people treat us a certain way, but how we're supposed to reach out to other people, how we're supposed to act towards them. I'll end with parts of today's reading in Eugene Peterson's The Message and focus on how Jesus told us to reach out. Live generously. Here is a simple rule of thumb for behavior. Ask yourself you want, what you want people to do for you and grab the initiative and do it for them. I tell you, love your enemies. Help and give without expecting in return. You will never, I promise, regret it. Live out this God-created identity the way the Father lives towards us, generously and graciously, even when we're at our worst. God is kind. You be kind. Don't pick on people. Jump on their failures. Criticize their faults. Unless, of course, you want the same treatment. Don't condemn those who are down. That hardness can boomerang. Be easy on people you'll find life a lot easier. Give away your life, you'll find life given back. But not merely given back, given back with bonus and blessing. Generosity begets generosity. May God add his blessing and his strength to these words. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let's come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, we come to you in confusion. We come to you in sadness. We also come to you with joys and celebrations. We come to you with our entire lives. As we see what is going on in our city and what has gone on in our city, we pray for peace. We pray for understanding. We pray for the ability to listen, the ability to connect with one person, to speak with them when we find differences, and to find what we have in common. We pray that you watch over everyone this weekend, O oh God. We pray that, that there will be a peaceful resolution to what we've seen in the downtown. That people will be able to go about their lives again. That they'll feel comfortable in our city. We pray especially for the most vulnerable in our downtown. We pray for people with special needs who've been stuck in their homes. We pray for seniors who have not felt comfortable going out even to get their groceries. We pray that you watch over them, O oh God, and bring them to a time of peace and joy. We pray as well for everyone who's been involved in the convoy, everyone who's been involved in the occupation. We pray that they would arrive safely at home, that there would be a time of reflection, and there would be time of listening. May we strive, O oh God, to understand people we have differences with. You draw us together as your people, O oh God. You draw us together as the body of Christ. You draw us together as communities, as countries. In all things, O oh God, we seek your wisdom and your guidance. We continue to pray for all those who are ill. We pray for those who have lost loved ones, and we pray for comfort and peace for them. We pray that you'd watch over us, O oh God, as we move into what is next. We pray for safety with the opening up of our society as, our, as we see the numbers drop with COVID-19 and we have new freedoms. We pray that you would work through us, O oh God, to stay safe and to always be thinking of the needs of others. In silence, we also bring you our individual prayers. Prayers for those who are close to us and prayers for those who are far away and we've never met. And on this morning especially, O oh God, we pray for our friends at Knox Church downtown and St. Andrews downtown, for Karen Dimmick and Jim Pott, for comfort and peace as they find themselves in the midst of all that is happening. Watch over them, O oh God. Give them wisdom and guidance and let them know that we stand with them. Now in silence, O oh God, we bring to you our own individual prayers. Some of these are so deep inside us, are so mixed with emotion that we don't think we could ever put them into words. But we know that you hear the deep longings of our hearts. You hear the needs that exist inside us. You encourage us to bring those to you and to listen in silence. And so we pray and we listen in silence.
Let's join together in singing a new hymn, Let Us Hope When Hope Seems Hopeless. As we go into the world that surrounds us, as we try to define who is our enemy and who is our neighbor, may we find wisdom and insight and guidance from God's word, from those who are around us, and from the gift of God's spirit. Now may the Christ who walks on wounded feet walk with you on the road. May the Christ who serves with wounded hands stretch out your hands to serve. May the Christ who loves with a wounded heart open your hearts to love. May you see the face in everyone you meet. And may everyone you meet see the face of Christ in you. Go now in peace. Amen. May the Christ who walks on wounded feet.